Hello, everyone, and welcome to the session of the K Boyle Society called K Boyle's Lives. Um, I'm here with uh, four colleagues whom I will introduce briefly, and then each of them will speak for about 15 minutes, no more than 15 minutes, and then there will be an opportunity for them to either talk with each other or, because this is pre-recorded, we have some questions that were sent in by members of the K Boyle Society. So I'll give you a brief overview of the session, and then I will introduce the speakers right before each person speaks. Um, so we will be hearing from Anne Boyd Rue uh, first, uh, her, her presentation, The Writer and the Baron, How Joseph Frankenstein Shaped the Life and Work of K. Boyle. Uh, next, we will hear from Carol Piacente, uh, why it matters that K. Boyle's irises are blooming in my garden, the challenge of writing truthful fiction. After that, we'll hear from Krista Quesenberry, K. Boyle's correspondence with James Laughlin. And finally, we will hear from Ian von Frankenstein, K. Boyle's uh, only son out of her six children. Um, and he will be speaking uh, on the topic of K. Boyle, our last days together. So I will uh, introduce you first to Anne Boyd Rue. She is professor of English at the University of New, or New Orleans and a specialist in American women writers. She has a PhD in American studies and has published seven books, the most recent of which are Meg, Joe, Beth, Amy, The Story of Little Women and Why It Still Matters, uh, published by Norton in 2018 and Collected Stories by Constance Fenimore Wilson, the Library of America, 2020. Her current project is a book about Kay Boyle, focusing on her years in Europe before, during, and after World War II, for which she's received support from the National Endowment for the Humanities and American Philosophical Society. So, Anne. Thank you, Sandy, and I really appreciate the opportunity to be a part of this panel. Um, so as I reported at the last K. Boyle Society meeting at the ALA two years ago, I have been researching a book project on K. Boyle's life and work, focusing on her engagements with fascism in Austria in the 1930s, in France during the war, and in Germany after the war. The more research I have done, the more I've realized how fundamental her third husband, Joseph Frankenstein, is to that story. Joseph hasn't received much attention from scholars. He's generally a minor character, one of Boyle's three husbands, one of the two great loves of her life that broke up two of her marriages. She, I'm sorry, the two great loves broke up two marriages, not that he broke up two, <laughs> that didn't sound right. He appears in Joan Mellon's biography as a rom romantic figure whose idealizing love lures Kay away from Lawrence and most of her children. The need to support him and the two children they had together diminished Boyle's art in Mellon's view. In my view, however, Kay's writing and her love for Joseph were two sides of the same coin. They can't be separated. And her great empathy for the exiled, homeless, and persecuted millions produced by mid-20th century fascism are at the heart of both. Certainly, this still would have been a central theme of her life and work had she never met Joseph. This great empathy was, after all, what I believe drove her into the arms of Kurt Wick. The Don Juan of the Slopes, or as Lawrence Vale called him, a cheap lady killer, an Austrian yodeler. <laughs> Kay was trying everything she could to get Kurt out of the Foreign Legion and to America as the Germans marched into France in June 1940. But after Joseph came into her life the following month, her pleas changed. There were no, they were no longer on behalf of one man, but for all of the refugees this war was creating. She wrote to James Laughlin on August 2nd, 1940, she was obsessed by this matter of the civil status of ex-Poles, ex-Austrians, ex-Czechs in France. I literally beat my head and scream all day and night about it, she said. Some country must do something about the situation of these men, and they must be given papers which will enable them to live as human beings, not as outcasts. Joseph was for her the symbol of all that the Nazis sought to wipe out, particularly the freedom of the individual to think and act for him or herself. Joseph had kept his individual spirit alive as Kurt had not in the, inhumane, in the inhumane conditions of the camp. Falling in love with Joseph seemed inevitable, as did the turn that I think we can see in Boyle's work at this period, focusing more and more on the plight of individuals ensnared by the web of fascist oppression. Joseph made the life of a refugee real to her in a way that nothing else had before. 
and she fell in love with him at the same time that she tried as a writer to inhabit his experience. Life and art became inseparable. After returning to the US, she would devote herself more and more to the cause of exiles like Joseph, giving speeches in which she told audiences that she did in February, 1942, they, the outcasts, the dispossessed, the disowned are our responsibility and we cannot turn aside. This commitment would remain with her for the rest of, the, rest of her life, all the way through her work on behalf of Amnesty International. It was from Joseph, in fact, that she learned about the great solace and hope that letters from the outside can give the unjustly imprisoned, who often feel they have been forgotten by the outside world. Kay and Joseph's relationship would begin in precisely such a context. Along with Kurt Wick, Joseph and other men of Austrian birth were put in concentration camps shortly after France's declaration of war in Germany. They ended up eventually at a concentration camp in Saint-Savin, France, where Kay visited Kurt in late 1939 or early 1940. It's not clear whether she met Joseph at that time, but he writes of having seen her through the camp gates. It was after that that he began to receive letters from her, the only person in the outside world who knew where he was and seemed to care about his fate. With these few formal letters, which sadly do not survive, or I haven't been able to find them yet, she won his heart. In fact, they would later give their son the middle name Savin after the name of the town where Joseph was interned. And I assume that was the only happy memory that he had of his time there was getting Kay's letters. After the fall of France to the Germans, Joseph escaped and returned to Mejev, which was in the unoccupied zone where Kay was living in France. And he became a tutor in the Vale household. According to Kay Boyle's portrait, portrayal of his return in Primer to Combat, she invited him over for dinner as soon as he returned. His stories about life in the camp and the circumstances that led him to flee his homeland and hide away in the French Alps kept Kay and Lawrence so enthralled that they almost forgot to eat. They learned that Joseph was an Austrian baron descended on his mother's side from the Habsburgs. He'd studied at St. Andrews, taught at Eton, and earned a PhD in history at the University of Innsbruck. Kay was fascinated and eager to know about his time in the camp. She had been writing a novel about Kurt's experiences that had stalled because she didn't have enough information about life in the camp. Now here was someone who could tell her all about it. Nothing mattered except seeing those men in the concentration camp as I had never before been able to see them, she wrote in her diary that evening. Thus she began writing again, this time through Joseph's eyes. Before she had always called it her concentration camp book. Now, when she wrote to Joseph about it, she called it your book. Two files in her papers at the Morris Library um, at Southern Illinois bulge with over 200 pages of notes and draft pages of manuscript for this novel, which she had titled Primer for Combat. Much of the material derived from her interviews with Joseph. There are also letters in the voluminous files of their correspondence that he wrote to her in answer to her many questions about the camp, all of which uh, were to be material for her novel. What emerges from these pages is a heartbreaking portrait of life as a forgotten refugee. Although she would many years later tell Hugh Ford, my life can be known through my work, this episode of her life never made it into print, except in the short story, Men, which she directly based on an experience of Joseph's while he was in the camp. Her letters to Joseph indicate why she never published the concentration camp novel she wanted to write. Although by September, she was again pounding away on her typewriter, invigorated by the empathy of all that Joseph had gone through, the writing slowed as she fell in love with him. On October 30th, 10 days after they became lovers, she told him she didn't feel right about writing this book about him anymore. I feel like a bad journalist, worming my way into your innermost heart to eavesdrop upon your anguish. It's too literary and too impertinent what I'm doing, she wrote to him. Of course, the crisis of her leaving Lawrence and trying to get Joseph out of France would consume her in the coming months and make writing nearly impossible. But in December, she could no longer write the book, she told Joseph, because I feel I'm doing you the greatest wrong in writing about Seth Hornick, the name that he had chosen himself for his character. For it is your experience I'm infringing on. It is your book to write or allow me to help you write, not mine. And that, aside from the fact that I can think nothing of nothing but you and what is to become of you night and day is why I can't write this book about you, perhaps another in which I have some part, but this one truly seems an impossibility to me now. 
The book she published as Primer for Combat in 1942 would be a very different book from the one she was writing. Based on her own diaries, it is the story of Frances Fall from her own point of view. Joseph appears as Sepp Hornick returning from the camp and eliciting her sympathy, but not her love, at least not explicitly. Then after the war, she published the first parts of the novel she'd been writing about Kurt under the title 1939. That short novel stops when he gets on the train to go to the camp. Sadly, Joseph never did write his own story and there was much more to tell. So much that I find him becoming much more than a supporting character in the book that I'm writing. He did make it out of France, of course, and was reunited with Kay but he faced many more threats to his freedom in the US. He was at first refused admission to the country and held in a hotel in Miami until Kay could get her friends to wire him $350. He wrote to Kay then, it matters little to me if they shove me into a concentration camp. It will only be the ninth I have been into. Although I do wonder if I couldn't have helped my cause better if I died a prisoner in a German concentration camp. At least I would have known what I died and rotted for or better the world would, or some minor part of the world, but here. Then after Pearl Harbor, Joseph registered for the draft. Of course, they were able to send the money and he got out. Then after Pearl Harbor, Joseph registered for the draft, but he was taken into custody by the FBI while trying to leave California, where he'd been working on a ranch. He feared he would be put in a camp again or drafted before he got back to Kay in Nyack, New York, but they released him and told him no aliens were allowed to travel. In the coming weeks, he was searched by policemen, had his letters opened and read, uh, stood in line with Japanese in a scene that reminded him of the desperate refugees he'd seen in Marseille. Finally, Joseph arrived safely in New York at the end of January 1942, but in the coming months, he was again unable to find work. In July, he was called into the FBI and had to endure hours of grilling, which agents shouted at him and threatened deportation if he couldn't support himself. Joseph was a wreck afterwards, at his lowest point since leaving France. Finally, in August 1942, Joseph was inducted into the US Army and was able to prove his loyalty and his ability to earn a living and apply for citizenship. He joined the 87th Mountain Infantry Company I. After so many years of rejection by his fellow man, Joseph had at last found his place in the world, but it took him away from Kay and the life they'd hoped to build together in the American West. Joseph's regiment stationed at Camp Hale near Leadville, Colorado in the Rocky Mountains turned out to be as multinational as France had been in 1939, with men from all over Europe who'd grown up in the mountains, including two of the Von Trapp brothers of later Sound of Music fame. Joseph's age, 32, and his mountain experience made him a trusted older brother to many of the young men in his company. Unfortunately, a cloud of suspicion and prejudice still followed Joseph and the other immigrants and war refugees. A rumor circulated that he would be left behind when the regiment headed to Europe, their loyalty to the US in doubt. Well, Kay was writing a novel based on Joseph's experience in the camp, which would become his human majesty. His regiment participated in the Aleutian campaign in the summer and fall of 1943. When they returned to Colorado, Joseph was given the responsibility of training troops in the newly formed 10th Mountain Division. But soon he applied for transfer to the Office of Strategic Services, forerunner to the CIA, which was recruiting Austrian immigrants to infiltrate their homeland in the aftermath of the planned inv invasion of France. After Joseph's transfer came through, he underwent a rigorous training, including close hand-to-hand -hand combat and crawling under live machine gun fire. In mid-August 1944, he was sent for advanced training to London and became a certified parachutist. In February, he was sent to France where he was promoted to second lieutenant. And in April, he infiltrated into Austria wearing a German Wehrmacht uniform and carrying forged German credentials. During his time undercover, he was most proud that information he collected led to the rescue of 200 political prisoners, including the last chancellor of Austria, Kurt, Kurt Schnuschnig, that's a hard one to say. Unfortunately, Joseph and his radio man were betrayed and arrested by the Gestapo. The latter was killed, but Joseph was taken to the Reichenau concentration camp outside Innsbruck and tortured for three days. They beat him repeatedly, nearly breaking his back, tore out three of his fingernails, and over and over again stood him against a wall, the submachine gun pointed at his chest, but he never broke. 
Joseph managed to escape, but his accomplice, a fellow prisoner, was caught and killed. Joseph rejoined his crew of OSS and resistance fighters and helped arrest Nazi officers before the Americans' arrival on May 3rd, three days before the German Reich consented to full and unconditional surrender. Joseph's post-war denazification activities were extensive, first in Austria and then in Germany, where he worked as a translator on the Nuremberg trials and then worked in various positions for the State Department, including as an editor for Die Neue Zeitung, the newspaper of the American sector of occupied Germany. Unfortunately, Joseph's diplomatic career was cut short in 1953 when he was fired under suspicion of communist sympathies after the visit to Germany by Joseph McCarthy's henchman, Roy Cohn, who had Kay's books removed from American libraries there. Maybe you've heard of Roy Cohn as he would later become Trump's mentor, Donald Trump's mentor. Sadly, Joseph wouldn't be exonerated and reinstated at the State Department until 1962. And he died less than a year later on October 27, 1963 of cancer at the very young age of 53. Had Joseph lived longer, maybe he would have written the story of his remarkable life. Or more likely, he would have told it to others as the stories of the World War II years began to be recorded and collected in the final decades of the 20th century. Trying to recreate Joseph's story now won't be easy, but I've decided that I can't tell Kay's story during these years without frequent detours into Joseph's own. So the working title I now have for my book reflects the fact that it will be a dual biography. The Writer and the Baron, a story of love, exile, and fighting fascism during Europe's darkest days. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, We'll have time for questions after everyone has spoken. So um, I will uh, like to introduce now uh, Carol Piacente. Uh, Carol Piacente is an award-winning writer who takes her themes from history, travel, and the hidden layers of the human heart. As a student of Kay Boyle's, she is now writing a biofictional novel about Kay's tragic love affair with the poet editor Ernest Walsh and her emergence as one of the leading authors of the modernist avant-garde. Kay Boyle was my muse and inspiration, she says. Kay's books and stories and a recently rediscovered cache of letters written to her by Kay, along with Kay's notes on her manuscripts, served as a touch point through the process of bringing the character, Kay Boyle, alive to a new generation of readers. When she's not writing, Carol loves to travel and imagine the stories that have shaped the locale she visits. She shares with Kay Boyle a belief that with privilege comes responsibility. You can visit her online at www.carolpiacente.com. Thank you, Carol. Okay, thank you. Kay Boyle inspired me to write and taught me how. And now I'm writing a biofictional novel about her, which is why the irises in my garden matter. The irises bloom just outside the window near my desk. They were a gift from Kay following a party held at her Frederick Street house in San Francisco to dig up and separate the bulbs. They remind me of the special responsibility I feel for bringing Kay fully alive on the page. In my novel, I trace the arc of Kay's tragic love affair with a poet and publisher, Ernest Walsh, through her rise as a leading voice of the lost generation, a term she firmly rejected. Today, I'll use examples from the novel to illustrate how biofiction differs from biography in voice and purpose. I first met Kay as a student in her creative writing class. I walked into a cold, totally utilitarian classroom at San Francisco State University, blinds on the windows, standard issue metal desks, to be greeted by an elegant woman in a lilac suit, great white earrings framing her face. The image was an anomaly on a gritty urban campus caught in the throes of student unrest and violent police clashes. Kay Boyle scanned our eager faces with the bluest of eyes, eyes at once piercing and amused. And as she spoke, each word clear and lucid and carefully chosen, 
Kay Boyle dispelled the chill in the room. Writing, she told us, is as much about conviction as it is craft. You must only write what you believe. I'm quite sure I wasn't the only one among the barefaced young women in our two short dresses and the young men in their black leather jackets to fall a bit in love with Kay that day. I left that first class to read everything of hers I could find. I was captivated by the poetry of Kay's metaphors and her brilliant prose. Who wouldn't fall in love with lines like these? Over them was the sky set like a tomb. A slow rain had begun to fall and the fruit blossoms on the banks were immediately bruised black with it. What a day for a wedding. I learned from Kay that writing such images requires more than sensitivity. It requires keen observation and scrupulous attention to detail. One of the first assignments she gave us was to describe a bird in flight. Look for shape and movement. Describe how the bird adjusts the angle of its winds, wings, how the shadows change. As a novice writer, it seemed impossible. But I traipsed down to the bay with my notebook and stared hard at the gulls, doing my best to translate the living things into words. The seagulls I saw that day lived on in my memory. And in my novel, I use them, or their French cousins, to show Kay's frame of mind and a bit of her creative process when she witnessed their slaughter. I show her watching as the birds take flight gliding out low over the rough waters of the estuary, dipping and turning in long swooping arcs, their colors illuminated by the weak winter sun. And then crack, a fisherman blasted his gun in all directions as birds fell one by one, and then by the tens into the sea. Outraged by the incident, Kay rushed home to express her feelings through a new character the defrocked priest in her novel, Gentlemen, I Address You Privately. I convey her sense of urgency as she reflected on the dialogue that was as real to me as if it were being spoken aloud. I repeated it over and over in my mind so as not to forget a single word before I could put it down on paper. Told yet another way, a different character might have admired the sh shooter's marksmanship it all has to do with voice and point of view. In biography, the voice is always that of the biographer. But in fiction, the writer gets to choose who tells the story, whether in first person or third, close or omniscient. In my case, I felt I didn't have a choice. The first person narrator, Kay's voice, is the only voice I heard. And that's the very purpose of biofiction to tell the story from deep within the character's consciousness as the writer imagines it. Take, for example, the moment of Walsh's death. Kay wrote in her autobiography that it was four in the morning when she removed the breathing tube from his mouth. I imagine her pressing her lips to his and closing her eyes against the coming sunrise as she thought, I couldn't bear the unimaginable cruelty of daylight breaking over the mountains without him there to see it. Of course, I can't know what Kay was thinking, but I'm free to imagine it. I'm writing a work of fiction and I don't pretend that it records what actually took place. I can only speculate, given the available facts, what could have happened. That could is where the biofictional novelist lives. In writing about Kay, it was also the biggest challenge. I was being too careful. I had to let go of checking every fact and worrying about making a mistake. I had to trust in what I've come to call informed intuition. Only then could Kay emerge as a three-dimensional, believably authentic character. But I'm getting ahead of myself. In addition to voice and point of view, the fiction writer chooses where to begin and what to exclude. In a life as expansive as Kay's, and as Sandra Spanier tells us, Kay Boyle knew everyone and saw it all, there's far too much history for a single novel. I chose to write about Kay as a young woman, romantic, talented, ambitious, 
her sight set on being a writer, but still finding her way. It's a sentiment perfectly expressed in lines she often recited from a favorite poet, Robert McAlman. Where are the pieces quivering and staring and muttering that, all, that are all to be a part of me? Those lines, a kind of anthem for self-discovery, are also an apt metaphor for writing a biofictional novel. All those bits and pieces to bring together in some sort of coherent whole. The facts tell us that Kay's affair with Ernest Walsh began simply enough. He'd solicited her work for his new literary magazine, where her name would appear on the masthead alongside William Carlos Williams, James Joyce, and another talented newcomer, Ernest Hemingway. Quite the aphrodisiac to an aspiring new writer. Soon after, Walsh learned Kay was ill, possibly with tuberculosis, and invited her to join him on the Riviera to, co to convalesce. The scene was set for all that followed when she arrived on the train station to see a tall, slender man striding toward her across the platform, a beautifully supple woolen overcoat draped elegantly over his shoulders. I imagine it like this. Ernest Walsh, his black eyes filled with mirth, swept me into his arms, quite literally off my feet, and I knew the image would never leave me. But Kay would learn Walsh wasn't living alone. He shared a rented villa with his rightfully jealous benefactor, Ethel Moorhead. I pictured the three of them after dinner that first night with Kay and Walsh, who she called Michael, standing at the open terrace door as they watched the lights come up in the villas down the hill and the cone of moonlight spreading on the dark sea below. Michael began to cough, lightly at first, almost with a gentle hiccup, but then the cough turned rough and he pressed a handkerchief to his mouth, the blood staining through the white linen. I guess the fun is over for the night, he murmured, his words thr throttled in his throat, his chest heaving with the effort to breathe. I'm off to bed. Kay, shocked, was left to hike up the steep path to her pension in the dark with Ethel's ominous warning in her ears. Be careful not to stumble on the uneven stones. The path can be quite treacherous. Treacherous indeed. Soon enough, Kay, pregnant with his child, would be nursing Walsh through his final days and fending off the strain of their unnatural threes a crowd arrangement with Ethel. Those are the biographical facts. As a novelist, I can embellish those facts with dialogue, interior monologue, to, review, to reveal the mode and mood and motivation, the emotional truth of my characters. I can have them dance in the moonlight, fall out with friends, take a lever or get drunk on champagne. The point is to let them show themselves for who they truly are. In Kay's autobiography, she described Walsh, Walsh as a reckless driver. Here's how I show his impetuous nature as Kay experienced it on a mountain drive with Walsh at the wheel. This is what we need to live, he whooped. He round as he rounded curves so tight they appeared to loop back on themselves. I was thrown sharply against the car door which threatened to fly open from the impact. He drove like the pilot he'd once been, cutting a split through the great blue beyond. At another point, plate, plates rattling like loose teeth in Kay's shaking hands tell us everything about how unnerved she was by a quarrel between Walsh and Pauline Pfeiffer, Hemingway's then mistress. Throughout the novel, with the events of her life as background, I come back to Kay's overriding ambition, and more than anything else, Kay Boyle wanted to be a writer. It was, after all, part of Walsh's attraction. He mentored Kay, published her work, and introduced her to the vanguard of writers who are transforming modernist literature. In addition, she took from him the twin themes of illness and death that served as a motif for much of his, her early work. But just as often, Walsh's own needs came first. I show Kay explaining to her sister Joan why she's up at dawn to work on her novel. When he has the energy, Michael works for hours every day on the magazine, and I, 
Well, it's quite a job keeping up the villa and shopping and cooking and acting as secretary to him. It's the only time I have. In other words, revolutionary mores were fine when it came to art and free love, not so much when it came to running the household and serving as helpmate. It wasn't until after Walsh's death and the birth of their daughter, Bobby, that Kay finally made it to Paris, the center of the literary universe as she saw it. Once there, she reached an apex as the golden girl of the expat crowd. In this scene, she's entering a party hosted by Eugene Jollis, her editor at Transition. <laughs> Judging from the crush in the foyer, everyone was there. Philip Sopole and James Joyce and Gertrude Stein. As we swept into the salon, I was aware of the picture I made in a long column of orange pan velvet. The dress clung to my breasts and hips, shimmering in the lights from the chandelier. More than one glass was raised in a kind of toast as I passed, and Archibald MacLeish abandoned his wife to bring me champagne. Ah, the talented Miss Boyle, he said. Your name is all over Paris among those in the know. He took my hand, giving me, giving me a twirl, and your person, he said, is as refreshing as your poetry. Heady as it all was, Kay, still haunted by Walsh's death, fell into a kind of nihilistic madness. Those are some of the most difficult scenes for me to write. It's like watching a friend make a series of terrible mistakes when all you can do is stand by and take notes. It took a near fatal case of cerebral meningitis and the threat of lo losing custody of Bobby to shake Kay out of her depression. But through it all, Kay Boyle never stopped writing. No longer the searching young girl, she emerged from adversity, a fully realized, confident woman, ready to claim her place. I began with a poem from Robert McAlman, so it's fitting to end with a note he left for Kay, bequeathing his new Remington typewriter to her. Yours looks to be in pretty bad shape, he wrote. This ought to last through several more books, which of course it did, more than 40 volumes. My sincerest hope is that panels like this will encourage new readers to discover Kay Boyle, and perhaps they too will fall just a bit, little bit in love with her. Thank you. Thanks very much, Carol. Next, I'd like to introduce uh, Krista Quesenberry. Uh, Krista is a visiting assistant professor of English at Albion College in Albion, Michigan, where she teaches professional writing, journalism, and literature. Her scholarship focuses on American life writing of the 20th and 21st centuries, and her work has appeared in American Literary Scholarship, Life Writing, the Journal of Graphic Novels and Comics, the Hemingway Review, and various edited collections. She was also an associate volume editor for Cambridge University Press's The Letters of Ernest Hemingway, Volume 5, 1932 to 34. Currently, Krista is working with me on a collection of K. Boyle's correspondence with James Laughlin, founder of the New Directions Publishing Company. The book to be published by W.W. W. Norton will be the first volume in its series of Laughlin's correspondence with other writers to feature a female correspondent. Krista holds a dual title PhD in English and Women's Studies from Pennsylvania State University. Uh, Krista. Thanks so much, Sandy. I'm so happy to be here on this really lovely panel. Um, so many of us, I would actually venture, probably all of us have read Kay Boyle's non-traditional memoir, Being Geniuses Together, um, which as we know, winds Boyle's narrative of modernist Paris around poet Robert McAlman's story. Boyle told Leo Litwack at the New York Times in 1984, and this is gonna be a longer quote, that she had a great admiration for Robert McAlman's work. This book of his, Being Geniuses Together, was published in London in 1938, and after his death in 1956, I, Kay Boyle speaking here, tried for two years to find an American publisher for it, and they were not interested at all. And then my great friend, Ken McCormick at Doubleday, suggested they alternate chapters of mine with his because we hadn't been close friends and we had been there at the same time. I felt very bitterly that McAlman's work had not been appreciated. 
And I was very anxious to do this. I think the real meaning of autobiography, the real reason for it, should be to defend those who were unjustly treated and dealt with in one's own time. And I felt that McAlman had been very unjustly dealt with. This to me is a perfect example of Boyle's advocacy for the art, artistry, and ideas that she believed in. She begins with her positive appraisal, her admiration of his work. And then on this basis, she reports working for two years unsuccessfully, then finally leveraging the social capital of a friendship to find a way, this creative and unconventional way to get McAlman's work back into print. The solution is, of course, successful and leads to multiple printings of the braided memoir. Um, Boyle's comments to the Times end with her positing autobiography, like many forms of writing, as a stage for fighting injustice and setting the record straight. Of course, Boyle had another reason for publishing this complicated and contradictory co-authored memoir, um, and that was to set her own record straight, right? To tell the story of Paris as she experienced it against the grain of the romantic narrative that was firmly entrenched even then nearly 40 years ago. Um, and in her account to the Times about the whens and the whys of that memoir, she really does focus on her appreciation, on her effort, and then ultimately on her theory of why this work matters to the span of literary history. Throughout her career, Kay Boyle leveraged her reputation, she leveraged her writing capabilities, and she leveraged her relationships in the publishing world um, as a way to shine a spotlight on deserving and underappreciated literary figures. Just as a political advocate and ally leverages positions of privilege to right the wrongs of injustice. Boyle took seriously the opportunity afforded to her by her literary successes, and she used her skills as an advocate to increase the number of beneficiaries of that success. At the 2017 ALA conference in Boston, the last time I had the pleasure of appearing alongside esteemed K. Boyle Society colleagues, I talked about Being Geniuses Together and its representation of Boyle's position within an ecological rather than a hierarchical arrangement of early 20th century literary figures. Today, I'm beginning in that familiar territory of the memoir as a means to observe a pattern in Boyle's life, uh, one that shows up a lot in her correspondence with editor James Laughlin of New Directions Press. And there is, as Sandy mentioned, a good reason for that. Um, Sandy uh, gave, a, I think, a good overview of what we're doing with this book uh, coming out from Norton, um, giving, the, uh, giving a selected view of the correspondence between Laughlin and Boyle. Um, and I'm, I'm where I think we're both really excited for it to be the first uh, in the series to feature a female author. So we're very happy for Kay to have that position. Um, and we can say more about that project in the Q&A if anyone might be interested. But for today, I'm focusing on three very specific moments that are illuminated by the Boyle Lachlan correspondence and that replicate that dynamic of my opening example and demonstrate Boyle's role as an advocate for literary excellence as she recognized it. So the first of these is a scenario not unlike the situation with McAlman, uh, this time relating to Italian poet Emmanuel Carnivali. Boyle was not shy in pressing Lachlan to publish an autobiography of Carnivali. On July 16th, 1939, I'm starting kind of late in their discussion about it. They talked about this for a very long time. She wrote to Lachlan, I wish you were here to walk the glaciers with us. They're marvelous this year. Also, I would like to know what you are going to do about Carnivali. I want, as you know more than anything else, that this book should appear and that it should appear before his death, which is ever imminent. Won't you let me know? You must know how very much I'm counting on you. Both Boyle's voice in the letter to Lachlan and her appeal to him are very personal. This is a matter of their relationship and her counting on him to make this happen for Carnivali. Months earlier in the conversation about this proposal, on October 23rd, 1938, after Lachlan had sent several apologies for not getting to it sooner, Boyle prompts Lachlan again for a response. She says, she writes, I'm so anxious to hear what you saw of the Carnivali typescript that I can't help writing you again. Uh, Boyle goes on to note that she sent the typescript to both Faber and Faber and Jonathan Cape for consideration, making the pressure now just as professional as it is personal at other times. Um, but ultimately, Boyle admits, I am hoping for some kind of hopeful word from you about it. And that uh, about a month later, just under a month later, on November 11th, 1938, Lachlan finally acknowledges Boyle's pleas, 
Um, and he claims that Ann Watkins snatched the Carnivale book away from me before I had a chance to read it. Uh, I expect it back. Do let me know what Cape decides. So there's this tussle back and forth of, you know, him delaying and her asking. He suspects in, in that uh, November letter that it would be a hard book to sell because there's prejudice among the intellectuals against that generation of expatriate and foreign writers. Nevertheless, I would like to do it if it's good. So then by mid-January, he gets back to Boyle and he says that he still hopes to get, the, to get to the Carnivale very soon now. And we get to finally April of 1939 and he replies uh, much to Boyle's dismay. And he says, about the Carnivale, I'm not keen. It's a retrogressive work. I'll feel obligated to do it if nobody else will, just because you want me to, but I'm scared to death of it. I, I don't mind no sales, but I do mind doing a book out of the past when so many good kids full of future are thundering at the door. See what I mean? I'm full of sympathy for poor C, but is that enough? It takes, it takes a while, but Boyle finally replies in June and she says, this is a, just a stunning letter of her pushing back um, and resisting. So I'm gonna read you a long clip of it, but know that this is, um, this is edited a bit because it's just, it's really powerful the way that she responds um, hurt and, 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 and is hurt by this. She says, I feel so strongly that Carnivale must be printed and by you that I cannot let you refuse like this. It means so much to me that your refusal to print it alters every feeling I had about you. I can't write quietly or feel quietly about him. I believe this book of his is even better than its period and better than any phase of many periods. And I believe it should be published even if its publication means the not publishing of two or three books of newer younger men. The newer younger men are still there writing, still writing with years ahead of them to write. And they have the hope and courage of youth. While for Carnivale, the publication of this book would mean the last chapter, the final act of his life. He has been one of our best poets, and for that, if for nothing else, he deserves this small, fiery monument to his name. How's that for advocacy? <laughs> for Boyle, the merits of the autobiography, and certainly its sales potential, are really not of much concern because the figure of Carnivale and his literary worth justify the telling of his story. She'd been counting on Lachlan to take the same position, or at least to be swayed by her passion. Um, and I, you know, I'm remembering again that New York Times interview, you know, way ahead of time and you know, 50 years later in 1984, where she says that the real meaning of autobiography is to defend those who were unjustly treated and dealt with in one's own time. So she's clearly formulating that stance, um, pushing back against Lachlan in, in 39. And that conflict ended up being not only pro pro professional, but personal. Um, she's still sore in 1940 in June, she writes to Lachlan about having bad days at, the mo at that time and adds that Lachlan uh, did disappoint her very much, almost more than anybody ever has. And that the only thing I felt really angry about, this is Boyle again, was that you did it in the way you did because we've always been frank about things and you could have been frank about Carnivale too. Though she reassures Lachlan that it's past and we won't even talk about it anymore, she does hang on to it. Um, it comes up again and again a, couple, a few times. And about a decade later, in January 1950, Boyle has still not, not fully forgiven him. She says that you published V, probably an Italian novelist, Elio Vitterini, um, that you published V and not Carnivale saddens me. For I believe there was far more there, far more spirit, far more beauty of writing, far more passion and compassion and a little less self-conscious posturing, but there we are. So Boyle, of course, um, did win out in the end by publishing Carnivale's autobiography in 1967 with Horizon Press, but Carnivale, who died in 1942, never got to see it in print as Boyle had hoped. Um, but what I really wanna point out in this, in this correspondence, and thanks for bearing with me through all the long back and forth, what I wanna point out is Boyle's praise of Carnivale being the basis of you know, why she thinks this, this autobiography must go in print, why she's pressing Lachlan to be the one to publish it. Um, and she contrasts that with the newer, younger men suggesting that she might be unsympathetic to postmodern authors in her time, but certainly that wasn't the case. Um, but throughout this, this correspondence, she's, she's, really, um, she's really trying to urge him to recognize her position on things. Um, and this happens basically in reverse in another case. Um, the case is with John, American novelist John Hawkes, who Lachlan actually introduced to Boyle. So frequently in their correspondence, um, Boyle is asking Lachlan to send her a New Directions catalog book, and they're kind of going back and forth about which books she might enjoy. 
So on June 9th, 1949, Lachlan writes to Boyle and says, we will soon be issuing a little first novel by an interesting boy in Cambridge named John Hawkes. And I'm going to make a label now to see that you receive it when it comes out because I think you may find him promising. The novel was The Cannibal and Boyle unfortunately was not a fan. She wrote to Lachlan a long personal letter on July 20th, 1950. And she says she tried to read The Cannibal but just couldn't get into it. I'm sorry, it seemed meaningless to me. Um, but sometime in the course of his subsequent publications, Boyle changed her mind. About 15 years later, when Lachlan had sent along Hawks's second skin, Boyle was so happy to have received it. And she claims having liked his work for a good span of years now. Um, in fact, she's so excited about receiving the book that she responds to Lachlan before even offering first impressions. And she asks Lachlan immediately to send her a New York address for Hawks because she would like to have him on the fiction panel at Wagner College in July. In July. Um, this panel is the New York City Writers Conference that Boyle was directing. She had also asked Lachlan to appear on the publishers and editors panel. So she's immediately really excited to have him appear in this professional setting. And Lachlan seems eager for Boyle's approval and delighted to have arrived, or arrived at the same conclusion about Hawks, even if he doesn't really remember Boyle's initial uh, response. So more than once in the mid 1960s, during much of Hawks's success, Boyle asks Lachlan for information about Hawks's eligibility for awards, which Lachlan enthusiastically endorses. Um, he, he writes in 1965, that's really great that you wanna nominate John Hawks's second skin for the award. I'm so pleased and I hope something comes of it. Uh, later in 1967, he writes, I'm so pleased to learn that you share my enthusiasm for the writing of John Hawks. To me, he's one, he's one in his generation who's really taken a step forward in fiction. What I think is interesting here is that um, Boyle's praise for Hawks is a lot less concrete than Lachlan's. Lachlan's really excited and Boyle's like, yeah, he's a great writer. Let's bring him in in these professional ways. Um, this strikes me as markedly different than how she supports Carnivali. And it seems particular to the quality and value that she sees in his writing. Um, she articulates that so passionately. It's more rooted in her desire to capture and recognize Carnivali's talents um, than Hawks's kind of position in literary history. So for Hawks, it's a lot more professional than personal, the way that I'm reading these letters. Um, it's, it's less passionate even. She seems to understand his importance and the motion of literary history, but she's trying to promote and participate in his recognition by bringing him into these professional awards and, and, and positions um, or opportunities. So for Boyle, the way that Hawks is rising to prominence, it's illustrating his savvy and shrewdness as well as hers, um, even if it's also undergirded by like a genuine desire to help another author. Um, so my last, my last example is a small one and it's a very different one. Um, this one's about Shig Murao, a Japanese American bookseller who worked at the famous San Francisco City Lights bookshop. Um, and Boyle writes to Lachlan on October 26, 1975 to report that he's had a serious stroke um, and he's really struggling to recover. And Boyle is planning a benefit party at her house. Um, and she and Lachlan work together and they, you know, Lachlan donates $100 and they kind of have um, a collaborative discussion about how best to benefit him without embarrassing him by making him feel like a charity case. It's this great discussion of how best to um, put forward this, uh, this opportunity to, to support this person within the community who's not an author. Um, so what I hope with this kind of additional third uh, alternative example, what I hope is clear at this point is that at the start of this relationship and their correspondence, Boyle was a lot more personal in her advocacy and that through their collaborations and the building of trust and commitment in their relationship, I think they both became better able to read one another just as Boyle was more adept at honestly asking for what she wanted. Um, and I think that the things that made her successful as an advocate outside of literature, socially and politically, those were the types of things that served her just as well when she advocated for sort of the social and political impact of literature when she was talking to people like Lachlan. Thank you. Thank you, Krista. Um, it's my pleasure now to introduce Ian von Frankenstein, um, actor, radio broadcaster, ESL, English as a Second Language instructor, dance floor DJ, bartender, and theater set carpenter for the past 25 years. Ian has lived a full and varied life that would appear to have always embraced the many forms of communication. He holds a Bachelor of Music degree from San Francisco State University 
and a graduate degree in linguistics from Sonoma State University. Now in his retirement years, he is pursuing yet another career in communication, that of an author of both prose and poetry. As Kay Boyle's only son, Ian is honored to be a participant in this year's Kay Boyle Seminar, part of the annual 2021 American Literature Association Conference. Well, thank you. Thank you, Sandra. I think I have my mute button off so you can hear me. Yes, but your camera is turned off. My camera is turned off. How did I do that? I didn't touch anything. Oh, here. There you are. There we go. There we go. Um, well, I feel honored uh, to meet all of you once again. And also, Krista, it's new for me. I didn't know you prior to this uh, day. Um, I'm coming from a very different place, obviously, um, uh, a very personal place. And uh, I've always wanted to write about my mom. And uh, this past winter in, um, in New England, where I'm now living, the circumstances were perfect uh, for beginning to write. It was February when I started to, to get this idea of uh, writing an autobiography in, in sections about my mother. Uh, and I started with this idea because I had so many notes of the last, say, four or five years of her life. And um, so I will begin by uh, reading what I have, which is just one of the chapters, and it's, a, and it's a, a work in progress, I should say. The moon just entered Libra, the astrological sign of balance and harmony. I sit here at my desk, thinking back some 30 years ago, during a time when mom was nearing the end of a very long and illustrious life. I can recall those days, weeks, months so vividly. The year was 1992 and she was living at the Redwoods in Mill Valley, California. The Redwoods was a retirement community of seasoned men and women who like white weathered birds, their lives now mostly spent were clutching onto their memories of another time, perched on fragile twigs. This was to be mom's last year and had been such a, a difficult one for her. On that late May afternoon, as I sat by her bed, she laying flat on her back, her thin head propped up by two pillows, she began to speak to me about the songs that she had sung when she was a child in, in St. Paul and later in Cincinnati. She paused and then she began to sing. Gone are the days when I was young and gay. Gone are the friends from the cotton fields away. And then I joined in, gone from this earth to a better place I know. And she turned to me and together we continued softly. I hear those gentle voices calling old black Joe. Again, she stopped and paused and looked straight ahead and then began to talk about her life, that after so many, many years and places, countries, hers had arrived here in this small room, her room that reflected her life now, as it was, consisting of several pieces of furniture, her, her green chest of drawers, her writing table, books in a bookcase, her favorite faithful lamp, and her bed. I'm close, close to the end, she said. And when I mentioned the future, her future, she, she gently shook her head. No, 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 I don't mean, I don't, I don't want to live that long anymore. She seemed so weary of it all. Just the thought of her failing existence from one difficult day to the next was a chore. I could see the weariness so clearly in her eyes. 
And with each step, she took down the hallway outside her door at the Redwoods. She moved so slowly, but yet so deliberately with her sweet cane and her blue shawl draped over her thin neck and shoulders, her silver white hair flattened slightly in back where she had lain her head down on her pillows. She seemed so like a, a, a wizened gray feathered heron complete with blue wings. That evening, as we walked down the carpeted hallway downstairs towards the dining room, there sat Seppi. Nearby, in the friendship room, as we passed by, Seppi, vibrant still and delicately thin framed, sitting in a large armchair waiting for the five o'clock hour to arrive. Seppi, who now was one century years old and who had been the Kapellmeister of the Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra so many lifetimes ago, so he proudly told us. Ever alert and with one eternal smile, his face so angelic and with his ears that appeared to be too big for his head, he extended his arm to me like a like a ballet dancer, outstretched. I took his frail hand in mine and held it. Then he said, you, you always look like you popped out of a box. Mom and I entered the dining room area already half full of ancient white birds, seated at the various rectangular tables which were scattered about the large room. Mom spoke little during our meal. She picked at her food and then clutching her fork in her gnarled fingers, lifted some mashed potatoes carefully into her gaping mouth, looking like a baby robin. A woman pushing her walker with a very round face and short gray hair looking like a potato patch doll shuffled by our table, humming a medley to herself. Mom smiled at her. The lady stopped and exclaimed how happy she was to see her. Mom said, sing us a song. The woman needing no further encouragement immediately launched into, Sing a song of six pence, a pocket full of rye. Da -de -da -de -da. And then her singing just trailed off into a barely audible hum. She smiled broadly, abruptly turned her walker around, and humming an unintelligible tune, disappeared. Mom leaned slightly towards me and whispered, she used to be an opera singer. Then she paused, lost in thought for a moment. She turned to me and asked if we would ever write another poem together. The question probably was inspired by the words, the lyrics, the, the potato patch gal had just sung. I said that I would have to think about it. She hardly ate it all. Soon we rose and left the table and her green beans her mashed potatoes half eaten, a few limp pieces of salad and some sad brownish pieces of dry meat lay abandoned on her plate. We made our way slowly down the familiar hallway to the small gift shop. I picked out and paid for two manila envelopes and then she stared at them and then said it didn't really matter anymore because she couldn't write anyway. As we walked back towards the elevator, her white hand firmly gripping my arm, she said she was thinking of Renato and his wife Carmelita, both housekeepers at the Redwoods. She had nine children, she said. I replied, well, you had six. Six children, that's pretty good. Then she added, six children, two abortions, and one premature miscarriage. You see, I said, that makes nine also. She suddenly found this all very amusing, which surprised me. She then actually chuckled, a strong, ebullient chuckle as we neared the elevator. 
When we arrived at her front door, she gazed thoughtfully at the door and its four numbers, 2306. You know why I chose this room? Because of those numbers, 2306. Six children and the day you were born, 23. We entered and she slowly sat down on the edge of her bed. She paused briefly, her head bowed slightly, and then slowly she struggled to lie down on her back. I gently lifted her legs up onto the bed. She dressed in her white slacks, her feet encased in her gray Rockport shoes. This was Marcel Duchamp's bed, she said softly, her eyes closed. Yes, Mama, I know, I replied quietly. She looked so tired. And yet there remained an elegance to her features, her, her ever-present blue shawl draped around her shoulders, her silver bracelets with the small embedded turquoise stones wrapped around her bone-thin wrists, her face, every pore of her skin, every line, every well-defined angle was a reflection of and a testament to a long, well-lived and well-worn life. Her white earrings seemed like two delicate butterflies that had landed lightly on her ears. She had told me on many occasions that she, she wanted to die. Her body was failing her, but her mind had not. I thought. I stood by her bed, feeling the great need to say something, some words of comfort, perhaps to give her a breath of courage and hope. Your spirit won't give up, I said. What? She replied, her blue eyes focused on me, all with a puzzled and slightly dazed expression. Again, I offered, your spirit won't give up, Mama. Your spirit won't die. There was a pause, a long pause filled with silence. She closed her eyes again. Uh-huh, she nodded, barely murmured, uh-huh. Her face in gentle repose, so still now, ancient and as timeless as the pyramids of Egypt. That's the chapter. Can I hear you? We're oh. all speechless, Ian. <laughs> it's we really beautiful. It's beautiful. It was amazing. Very, very beautiful. It's a different, obviously, because I was her son and I was so close to her in those last years. It's so different from this young, vibrant person that you are speaking about today, the one who charged through life and accomplished so much and had husbands and children and moved about and here her life has been simply contained in this small room that had come to this so anyway that's my contribution ladies <laughs> thank you ian thank you so much um we have some time uh and if we have some questions that were sent in ahead of time by that were invited by the president of the Cape Oil Society, Ann Rain. Um, and but first of all, would any of you like to pose a question to anyone else here, or oh. would you like me to <laughs> plunge into the questions that were sent? Yeah, how much time do we have? Uh, about twenty minutes. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Well, why don't you start with your list there, and perhaps it'll, it'll um, stimulate a conversation. Okay. Um, I'll start with one for, for Anne uh, Rue, and this question um, is, has it been challenging researching Joseph Frankenstein's life before he met K. Boyle? Uh, what resources are available and what documents have you uncovered that have given you insight into the young Joseph Frankenstein and helped you to verify the facts about his life before he met Kay. Right, so I have been able to find in her papers at um, the Morris Library in Southern Illinois, 
um, letters that he wrote to her early on. So those ones when she was interviewing him um, for you know the book that she was writing about him. Um, you know, he gave her like a statement about his life. Um, you know, and she, he would she would ask questions and he would answer. And so some of that's about his earlier years. Um, there are also the statements that he made about his life um, during his trial in Germany and, uh, you know, his um, affidavit and different things. I have some of that. Um, there's also uh, the Senate hearing that they were involved in. So there's Senate testimony. He's again describing his life. Um, that is actually online. You can find it in Google Books. Um, now, Joan Mellon in her biography cites his FBI files. And I am desperate to get a hold of these FBI files. <laughs> because, I okay, well, these are the, the files that the FBI kept on Joseph and Kay is my understanding. Um, and I have not been able to get those from the FBI. They are telling me that they may be destroyed. I don't know, of course, everything broke down uh, once the pandemic started. I haven't been able to get any responses. So who knows if and when I will ever find out anything from them. I'm hoping though that, because um, Joan Mellon uses them a lot in the book and I'm hoping that um, they are maybe photocopied in, um, in her collection at the Morris Library. So um, Joan Mellon donated, I think there are about 10 boxes. Um, of uncatalogued material at the Morse Library. This would, I'm hoping it will include transcripts of interviews that she did, um, that sort of thing. I haven't been able to get there yet because of the pandemic and they're not open until October. So I'm hoping they'll find more uh, once I get there. But the other thing that I'm very excited about is that Ian has put me in touch with relatives, uh, Frankenstein relatives in Austria and in Innsbruck. And yeah. they, uh, they appear to have letters that Joseph wrote um, when he was living in France and maybe even earlier, I don't know, maybe when he was away in England, um, I don't know yet. So I'm waiting patiently <laughs> and very hopefully uh, to find out what they have and they've offered to help uh, me, you know, read them and translate them, that sort of thing. So um, I might find out more there. So I have the, I have the outline of his early life. Um, but I'm, you know, definitely looking for more material. So that will probably be like an early chapter where I just kind of introduce Joseph to the reader and, and talk about his background. So. I do have some FBI files in a box. I, it, it's not, it's not like eight or ten boxes. It's just one box. No, and yeah. I, and, and I don't know how much I have, but I will check that out. And uh, whatever I have, I can send to you. That's great, Ian. Thank you. I'm grateful. Okay. Um, you can text me or email me later your address. Yeah. Wonderful. Nice to be able to talk to a very direct <laughs> connection. Yes. The, the yes. Yeah. Um, Carol. Not always so easy. <laughs> Carol, I, a, a couple of questions for you. Um, one is what published works would you point to as models of biofiction and do you have a work that you particularly admire? And a continuation of that is biofiction particularly tricky with a writer like Boyle whose life was so intertwined or whose lives were so intertwined with other people's lives that they become part and parcel of her own interiority. So how do you tackle the challenge of this as a bio writer? Um, well, starting with the examples of, of a couple of books, I mean, I, I have a list of them. Um, there's two that I'm going to mention because they, to me, they're doing something somewhat different from what I think of as bio, traditional biofiction. There seems to be a trend to add characters and incidents that really never happened or existed in life, um, which I think is kind of an inter interesting. So one of those is a book called um, Leading Men by um, Christopher Castellini, and it's about Tennessee Williams and his, his lover. Um, and it has, you know, some, this, a sort of main part of the book 
with this actress who never probably is a real person. I mean, there's speculation, oh, maybe he meant so-and-so, but it's, it's a way to show some things that the writer wants to show, but it, 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 a big diversion from the, the facts of what happened. Um, and another example, which I think is a wonderful book is um, Euphoria by Lily King, which is about Margaret Mead. And the thing that I love about that book, even though again, it diverges from what, you know, the, the facts of the <laughs> facts of life, um, is there's a section where it's really describing her process um, along with her husband and another researcher of coming up with one of her kind of main theories um, that she applied to her work. And it really has scenes where you get into their heads as they're developing this theory. So it's really fascinating for that. Um, and then a favorite of mine, which I, I find most relevant to what I'm doing is Colm Tobin's The Master about Henry James. Um, and what I love about it is it really is about a writer. So everything that happens in the book is referred back to his internal process and how he uses it or how he thinks about it in terms of his own writing. So you, you really feel like you see a writer at work. <laughs> um, so I love it for that, which relates to the second part of your question of writing about Kay Boyle, who's been well documented, um, both by, you know, in biography, but in her own fiction, she uses her life um, story in a lot of her fiction, um, which of course is challenging. And what I'm trying to do is bring a slightly different slant to it or emphasis to it, which is to, again, to look at her as a writer um, not just in terms of the events that are taking place, but her internal process. As I, I tried to, um, in, in my little talk, explain when she saw the birds slaughtered and how she translated that into an experience of one of her characters and, and wrote it down and used it. Um, so I'm hoping to do that. The real, the real Kay Boyle, who was very ambitious in terms of her own career and wanting to be a writer, um, and that's something that's not as explicit in some of her own fiction about her, in which she's a character. Thank you. So interesting. I love it. Fascinating. Thank you. Uh, Grista, a couple for you. Um, one, uh, do you think that you talked about Kay Boyle's persistent generosity and advocacy that she offered others. And do you think she was the recipient of such uh, persistent generosity and advocacy herself? Um, and then there's a, another question. Do you want that after or, or now? Whatever, Zee, yeah. That's fine. Okay. Uh, the second one, um, in your opinion, how did Boyle manage to combine or reconcile her sense that writers and editors should strive to deliver an honest critique with her relentlessly generous commitment to writers whom she cared deeply about, such as Carnivali, Walsh, or McAlman. Um, and is there any evidence in this correspondence with Lachlan that this dual commitment may have helped Lachlan with his own view of editorship? So that's a lot, but... <laughs> yeah, thank you. Those are really good questions that I can't answer definitively, but I'll take the easy one first. Uh, well, easier. Um, yeah, no, I think I think uh, it would have been really nice for Kay Boyle to have an advocate like Kay Boyle on her side um, earlier, right? Like, obviously, Sandy, you've done amazing work to, to bring her to the fore and make sure that we are still talking about her. Everybody in the Kay Boyle Society has uh, made great contributions to making sure that she she remains in the in the public eye and I think about you know the the work that Carol you're reading from and talking about and, and Ian you're doing that also does that same kind of support work and just says like hey there's this figure that that for some in some of our narratives of the 20th and 20 you know the the 20th century that gets um this figure gets um overshadowed at times so mm -hmm. I don't know that that I would say there was a lot of reciprocity. I don't know that um, these, especially you know, men that she upheld, uh, 
oftentimes they weren't able to. She outlived a lot of the people that she uh, lionized and that she really promoted. And and that's just a you know, practical matter of she continued to be plugged into the literary world and continued to be both publishing and meeting people and learning, you know, the, the John Hawkes example shows that she was able to see an, a literary movement take shape that, you know, many of the people that in her early life she promoted never imagined or, or knew about. So some of it's practical, right? Um, but I, you know, I don't think that, that her approach to being a for lack of a better word, a colleague or a member of the literary community. I don't think her approach was something that was really common. That's part of what I love about researching her and her life and her way of talking about herself in the world, um, especially in her in her nonfiction, right? I, I love thinking about how she um, you know, made moves and and did something that that a lot of other folks weren't doing. Um, and she did it not getting paid back for it as well as she she might have deserved. <laughs> um, so I yeah I think that's a really interesting piece of it. I wish I do wish she had had someone a little bit more on her team that could have done the same kind of fighting she's doing with the same ver you know verb that she did right with the same passion that she that she was able to do. Um, and then the question the second question um, if I if I understand it correctly is it's kind of about her ability to um, to balance critique and promotion of, you know, this kind of PR value and how much that impacted her relationship with Lachlan. Does that seem to capture it, Sandy, from what you I, have? I think so, yeah. That, that's, okay. that wasn't my question, but I, I'm really yeah, yeah. Okay. the best I can. Yeah. <laughs> that's a big question. Um, so yeah, I think I, I just, I don't get the sense. And, you know, I obviously, unlike many of the folks on this call, I didn't ever know her, um, but, uh, I, I get the sense that, and I'd love to hear somebody else chime in with, with firsthand knowledge, but I get the sense that she, she, when she delivered critique, she didn't feel she was um, doing something bad or mean or wrong. She was just telling the truth about literature, right? And the truth needed to be told about literature. And she's just so frank and so matter of fact that there's no, there's not in this correspondence with Lachlan, at least, there's not a lot of hedging. There's not a lot of you know, oh, this one, I just didn't like that. Like the example again about the Hawks novel. She's like, oh, I just couldn't get into it. It just isn't, it's just straightforward and matter of fact. And I think as much as her passionate promotion of other authors really moves me, it, I get the sense that it was also just matter of fact. Like, of course, this is the best poetry that exists. Well, how could you not publish the autobiography of this person? And it just seems so obvious to her um, in the way, in the voice that she uses. Um, and I think there's a lot of evidence that her and Lachlan's relationship is impacted by that and the way that she writes. I think she persuades him that she knows what she's talking about. Um, but I, I don't know how much I would have to think a little bit more about that question about whether Lachlan adjusted his editorial practices. Um, that's a really great question. And the series as a whole probably answers that much better than our volume will. So, so thanks for the questions, those who posed them. Carol, as a student of, of Kay Boyles, you might have a a perspective on that, um, what her critiques were like. Well, you know, um, one of the things that was that was interesting, because at the time I was new to the whole business of writing and getting any critiques, so I don't think I appreciated how um, clear and direct she was about what she liked and, and what needed to be better. There was no kind of you know, hedging her bets. Um, she wasn't trying to take care of your feelings, um, but she, and she was very precise. So I have all of these, all of these papers <laughs> um, in correspondence with her or from classwork with her um, in, in which she makes comments and they're very detailed. When I, when I realized as time went on, what an impressive, amazing, important figure she was. The fact that she's writing these very detailed comments and critiques and making suggestions is astounding to me. Um, you know, so she was encouraging, but she, and she wouldn't, you know, she didn't avoid saying, this doesn't work, try it again, or this, here you pay, you know, sort of here you paid attention to what I suggested and it's so much better. Um, so yeah, I think that her critique was, was honest and straightforward and she obviously put a lot of, of thought and work into 
both correcting student papers and then you know we stayed in touch for years afterwards sharing correspondence and such with that same kind of, of attention to detail and um, putting a real effort into it. So I, it's interesting to hear what you were saying about um, her critique of, of, of writers and, and support um, for them or non-support if she wasn't impressed. <laughs> That actually reminds me of my, my own experience with her because I had, had written my dissertation about Kate Boyle um, years ago. And uh, I had sent her uh, a copy of the dissertation after I had gotten my degree. Um, I got my degree when I was eight months pregnant with my son. And so somehow I think she <laughs> she liked that <laughs> aspect. She uh, was very kind to me about that and sent little baby shirts and things like that. But um, I had sent her my dissertation asking if I could have permission to quote from some of her unpublished letters at Southern Illinois um, that I had drawn from to kind of piece together her biography. This was, was um, there had not been a full-fledged biography of her. And I thought she would just give me a yes or no answer. And instead I started getting these installments responding to my 400 page dissertation really page by page, paragraph by paragraph, line by line. And it took her several months and a couple hundred pages, I think, of, um, of her responses, which was just astonishing that she would take that kind of care. Um, and I saw her also do that to student papers. She had invited me to Bowling Green um, University when she got an honorary degree. And she put me up at the home of uh, the, the person that, who was putting her up. And I just remember late at night, she retreated to her room and sat on her bed with student papers um, and told me to go to bed. But she was up late just writing these uh, painstaking critiques of, of the students' papers. And I thought, you know, I hope they realize how lucky they are. I'm sure they right. did. Yeah. Uh, that word, Sandy, is exactly the right word, care right? Care and investment. Mm -hmm. And that's the type of support that I think, you know, it doesn't have to be positive to, to be powerful. So right. those are great, great, great examples. Um, Ian, a couple of questions for you. Uh, as you age, how does your time with your mother in her later years shape your own attitude about getting older? And what inspiration might others find from your mother's approach to aging? Well, that's a good question because I was barely 50 when Kay died. And I remember, um, I remember being so close to her those last years, looking at her and saying, I'm not gonna be that way when I'm that age. <laughs> it's, 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 it's back to that old thing when you're younger and even 49 is, is, is well, it's all relative. But when you're, when you're younger, you don't really totally understand what old age is all about until you are there at the doorstep of old age. And uh, I would look at her sometimes. I just, I'd feel so much pity for her because she was struggling so hard physically. And I, I sort of had this metaphor. I said, sometimes she looked like she, or she was moving like she had fallen off a horse and had a terrible hangover. I mean, that's a terrible thing to say in a way, but it was just that she was so, it was so, difficult for her physically. And, and as I mentioned in that chapter that I read to you guys, you know, her spirit is what kept her going. And that's what was so timeless about it. And even though her body was failing her and there were, you know, and what she, in, in her poems, you know, I've looked, I looked at them this morning and, and they're so positive about old age. And you know, don't don't give old age any time. Uh, don't don't let old age take over. And uh, you know, I, I just here, I just I love this uh, the letter to Francis Picabia, the artist. I ask more of this season than leaves seeking the ground, birds guiding the wind south, or a doorstep swept clean for winter. And and then what she writes to Sam Beckett and what she writes to Caress Crosby in her, in these poems, they, so it's a kind of a dichotomy between um, being, 
brave, courageous, forthright, and then also having to deal with the reality of old age. And uh, I think she just somehow maintained a wonderful balance between the two, uh, even though I know she was suffering. I don't know if that's much of an answer, but um, yeah. uh, what she believed in and what her body was not able to keep up with were, were, were vastly apart. And one other thing I wanted to touch on was, um, because, um, I think it was Krista who mentioned uh, about Kay didn't have an ally. She didn't have another Kay Boyle. I think what we forget about is Kay's mother, Catherine Boyle, was extraordinary. I, you know, I really didn't know her. I met her once when she was near the end of her life and I was eight years old. But she was an extraordinary influence on Kay and Joan, her sister. And it gave her tremendous uh, uh, I think more than anything else, I think Catherine was a real inspiration for Kay and was always, a, she believed in Kay and gave her the confidence that is uh, usually so lacking when you started off in life. So. I remember Kay writing about how uh, when her, her mother would have uh, a dinner party in Philadelphia and would be reading, um, the work of Gertrude Stein to the doctors laughing or who then laughed themselves sick over this nonsense by Gertrude Stein. And then she proceeded to read some material by the young K. Um, and, and, and just as though she were on the same level uh, as a writer as, as Gertrude Stein. So mm -hmm. yeah, that, that idea of, of her mother absolutely believing in her is something that certainly shines through but yeah that, and that gets lost uh sometimes i also see a tremendous difference in the being geniuses together between robert mcalman's writing and Kay's writing i almost found robert mcalman's writing very, very bland like well we walked across the street then we had a drink at the coupole then i saw so and so and it was just kind of a, a sort of a, an account uh, a daily account whereas Kay, of course adds so much uh, imagery and drama so, well, There's one last question from our, from our K Boyle Society president in in France, uh, Anne Rain, and I should also just mention the geographical spread of of even this panel. Carol's in California, uh, Anne's in New Orleans, I'm in uh, Central Pennsylvania, Krista's in Michigan, uh, you're in Boston, and. Mm -hmm. And a whole contingent are over in Europe. Thomas Austenfeld, the founding uh, president, is in uh, Fribourg, Switzerland. So she really does have a, an amazing reach. But uh, this is what Anne had, had sent in. Um, there are some wonderful poems Kay wrote in her old age about growing old, and which, as you well know, are included in the 1991 edition of her collected poems. In the poem called Advice to the Old, including myself, for instance, she writes, do not speak for yourself for God's sake, even when asked, yodel your way through field <laughs> weeps, but not you, not <laughs> you. Rejecting self-pity with the same vehemence as in the poems written after Walsh's death in 1926. In another poem dedicated to Samuel Beckett, she further emphasizes no past tense permitted, either here or there. Would you argue that this is Kay's signature as a human being and as a poet? Yes, but again, like I said before, there was, there was a big sort of chasm between what she intellectually believed and what, what was happening to her body physically. But, mm -hmm. But even having said that, I think even up to the, the, the days and, and the weeks and days before she died, she still was able to maintain a tremendous uh, outlook on life and that she always tried to uh, continue that. And uh, I just want to read this uh, at the end of the Sam Beckett poem that she wrote. He says, she writes, if you go weeping through the forest, how will you find the way? Oh, rinse the iron of sorrow from your throat so that your voices are discordant no, discordant no longer. Dwell instead on the courage of the dead. They enter a world 
where they will carry the sun as a shield and learn to use their left instead of their right hands. Oh, hearken. It's almost Shakespearean in a way. Uh, so this advice to, uh, to the elderly, I suppose, uh, and, and what was really happening in her life. It's, um, yeah, as she writes of old age, urging older people not to resort to an alphabet of gnarled pain, but speak of the lark's wing. But it's the pain and not the lark that comes alive on the page. I think that's pretty good. In, in, in some of her poetry, it's the, you know, it's the pain rather than the, uh, the utopian lark. How many years would you say she was dealing with chronic pain? Old, relate to old age in particular. Uh, I would say certainly the last ten years of her life, from mm -hmm. from from eighty to ninety. Even though it's remarkable, uh, I keep thinking about this. I was living in Cottage Grove, Oregon, a small town near Eugene, and I was uh, working in radio at the time. And, and Kay was living in Miami with her daughter, and things weren't working out, uh, mainly because the climate. I told Kay that she wouldn't like Miami because Kay loathed <laughs> the tropics. She, she liked coolness. So I said, why don't you come here to Oregon? She drove at age 78 by herself in a 65 Malibu coupe from Miami, <laughs> Florida to Codge Grove, Oregon. Wow. She arrived, wow. She arrived the day after John Lennon was assassinated, December 9th, 1980. And behind my house that I had, there was a hill, maybe 200 yards up, straight up. And we had organized, myself and my friends had organized a tribute to John Lennon with a boom box and his, his last album. And Kay came along and at 878, <laughs> right up that trail and uh, didn't really, I don't think really understood or knew, knew the impact of John Lennon because something that she had never really paid as much attention to certainly, but that didn't matter. But the point being is that she had this ability physically to walk up this 300 yard path and partake in our, in our very humble tribute to, uh, to Lennon. Well. Memory and wonderful image. Every time I feel sorry for myself, I think about her driving across country at age 78 with an AM radio, <laughs> that's all she has. <laughs> Oh well, I can't, I can't, I can't. <laughs> yeah, well, Kay had that ability to, to forge ahead always. And Ian, a quick question related to, to the illness and the story you just told. Throughout her life, she had many severe illnesses, the kinds of things that it's amazing that she made it as long as she did. And so do you think that dealing with those various bouts of severe illness um, are part of what sort of forged that strength not to be done in by it. Yeah, it probably gave her some some confidence that she she did with starting with the meningitis that she had at a very early age. And then I remember as a child in Connecticut growing up that Kay had a, a terrible uh, bout with her gallbladder. And it was just, it just changed her life completely. It was just, you know, she couldn't eat. She was always in misery. And she finally had her gallbladder taken out in the late fifties and it completely changed her life for the good. Uh, I mean, those are the two that, and then of course she had two mastectomies and I wasn't around for that. Uh, but miraculously they were both, you know, successful in that the cancer never returned, which is usually not the case. So, you know, she did not die of cancer. She died of essentially of congestive heart failure. She just, her body just finally gave up, took her last breath. So, but um, yeah, I have other chapters that I write in more detail about some of these periods. And uh, I'm hopefully gonna put it all together in some kind of form. Well, thank you so much. Um, everyone, it, this has been a, just a fabulous uh, <laughs> presentations and conversation. Um, and 
to the folks who will be watching this in a few weeks, uh, please uh, feel free to email uh, us questions. Um, I can be reached sxs74 at psu.edu. And I can certainly distribute uh, any questions or comments around to the rest, but thank and you so much. And hopefully we'll get copies of this. Uh, yes, I- At some yes, point you can forward yes, email I, us. Yeah, as I understand it, this then will be um, made available to to members of the American Literature Association or of the author societies, but also I think it's going to live on YouTube for a while. So I will certainly let you know what I find out about yeah, that so you. that your friends can and other folks can mm -hmm. participate in this. Yeah. Even if it's yeah. a one way thing. Well, thank you so much. This is just wonderful. Thank you, Sandra, yeah, thank you for all. being the producer, moderator, <laughs> and the uh, spark to make this happen. Uh, well, Thank Much you. appreciated. Thank you. It was really, really both a pleasure and an honor to meet all of you. So I, I very much appreciated being included in this. It was great. Yeah. Oh, so I'm really glad you're included too, because I loved your presentation and I loved everybody's. It was so fascinating. I took lots of notes um, and I look forward to staying in touch. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Thanks so much. And Thanks, everyone. we'll be seeing each other, I hope in person. Uh, at the next at some point yes yeah. yes um well thanks a lot and we'll we'll sign off okay great thank bye you bye everybody bye